people start to wonder who's the speaker tonight because of the interaction here was on so long. But <clears throat> in reading this bio of uh, Larry Reed, I was so struck, I, I was in awe, wondering how in the world can a young man like that <clears throat> do what it says here he has done. <clears throat> so I got to read some of it to you. Larry Reed is president of the Foundation for Economic Education, headquartered in New York. The position he has held since September 1, 2008. Before joining FEE, Reed served as president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, a Midland, Michigan-based free market think tank. To date, he remains Mackinac's president and Redis. Reed's interest in political and economic affairs have taken him as a freelance journalist, listen to this, to 78 countries on six continents since 1985. It made me tired just reading it. <laughs> <laughs> in the old rock of Palestine. <laughs> Over the past 25 years, he has reported on hyperinflation in South America, black markets from behind the Iron Curtain, reforms and repression in China and Cambodia, and civil war inside Nicaragua, Mozambique, and Mozambique. Additionally, he spent time with the Contra rebels during the Nicaraguan Civil War, and lived for two weeks with Mozambique rebel forces at the Bush headquarters in 1991, while the country was engaged at the height of the guerrilla conflict. In 1986, while traveling with the Polish anti-communist underground, Reed was arrested and detained by the border police. An advocate for free market solutions to national and global issues, Reed has authored over 1,000 newspaper columns and articles, 200 radio commentaries, as well as dozens of articles in magazines and journals in the United States and abroad. His articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Christian Science Monitor, Baltimore Sun, Detroit News, Detroit Free Press, and USA Today, among others. During a night 2003 address on the floor of the House of Representatives, Congressman Paul, Ron Paul, paid tribute to Reed, acknowledging him as one of America's leading advocates for liberty, and remarked that Reed's writings reflect his unswerving commitment to limited government and the free market as the best way to promote human happiness. It's a real pleasure for me having met Larry before and, and know how well he can grab an audience and he's one of the few people who can discuss anything uh, along this line of the economics or whatever that I can understand. <laughs> I real credit to him. So, great pleasure and please walk you a warm welcome to Larry Reed. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It always is to come here on, under the auspices of the National Institute. I count Rick and Joanne as two of my very best friends in the Liberty Movement, and I'm so proud of what you've accomplished and the fact that in spite of all the odds and obstacles, you continue to persevere. In the long run, uh, that's what produces results. So, at fee, which is incidentally pictured on the wall there. I'm not sure if all of you knew that, but that is uh, a picture of our ancestral headquarters. Uh, Leonard Reed, our founder, no relation, spelled his name R-E-A-D, <laughs> bought that facility, those, uh, that building and those grounds in 1946 for $40,000. <laughs> and here all these many years later, 66 years later, uh, we are on the verge of moving from those headquarters to Atlanta, Georgia. So we're going to miss that building, but as I explained to a number of you, John in particular a little bit ago, uh, the economics of it I think spoke uh, volumes about the need for a move. We will cut our costs in half and be more effective uh, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. At the village of Irvington over the years, uh, They've been kind to us in other ways, but uh, when they came in and began to say, well, you can't use you know, the third floor of that building uh, to put people up anymore because the staircases are too narrow, or the other buildings on the grounds don't meet fire code, uh, then the handwriting was on the wall. It sort of made it plain that uh, 
it was going to cost us more and more to stay in a place that uh, was of less had less use to us. So we'll miss that. But uh, there are exciting things happening at FEE, uh, and many more to come with our new uh, headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. I want to tell you, and this will relate to my talk tonight, that uh, at FEE we've recently undergone a very substantial repositioning of ourselves in the movement, the liberty movement. For our first 20 years or, or more, FEE was either alone or virtually alone in advancing these ideas. So we were speaking to people of all ages and from everywhere. Uh, and that's difficult to market uh, when you're talking to folks who might be anywhere from 10 years old to 90. And in recent years, uh, we've recognized the fact that in part because of FEE, there are many other groups now all over the world that are in one way or another advancing ideas of liberty. So we took a closer look and decided, well, what is our niche now? Can we narrow our focus to reach a particularly underserved audience? And so we've recently decided that our new targeted demographic, as they say in the trade, uh, the focus of our attention is going to be on 16 to 24 year olds. It doesn't mean that what we do won't be of interest to older people. In fact, uh, I would guess you've already seen this, that it's some of our events, older people come because they want to see what we're telling the kids. And that they're finding it inspirational too. But we really think that that's where the future is for not only the obvious reason, but because they tend to be the ones who will listen if you reach them early enough. But in the course of repositioning ourselves, we've had to ask, all right, well, how do we do that? How do we reach young people with these ideas of liberty? We don't think it's enough to make the statement that, well, you should be for liberty because it produces the greatest amount of stuff. You can make that case. History is, uh, clearly demonstrates that. But uh, kids being typically idealistic, Want to, uh, you have to appeal to something a little higher than that. You may convince them that a free economy, that liberty, produces the most stuff, but have you really made a lasting convert? Probably not, because they'll be vulnerable to the first person who comes along later and says, well, maybe I would concede that, but it's you're talking greed, and uh, we have a higher moral calling than just making more stuff. So. The young person you thought was a convert now goes to the other side. So we've thought long and hard about well, what might be some of the strongest cases for liberty. And I want to share two of them with you tonight and then elaborate on the second one for the balance of my talk. The first argument, I think one of the most powerful that we don't use enough within the liberty movement, is that liberty is the one system, if you will, that isn't a system at all in the sense that it doesn't rely upon anybody's fanciful contrivance or contraption. It doesn't rest upon the imaginations of some central planner who will come up with some Rube Goldberg contraption for society, prescribing uh, uh, the course for other people's lives. Liberty is what happens when you leave people alone. When people respect the lives and the property and the contracts and the rights of others. If you look at the American Constitution, who's it aimed at? It's not a document that says, now here's how the people should live. Here's what they ought to do. No, it's aimed at government. It essentially is a document that says, government, here's a whole bunch of things you can't do. It doesn't prescribe the details of life for everyone else. It's aimed at government, and it says, we're striving here for a free society, which means we have to chain government to, uh, to a constitution, put limits on it, and tell the government, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. To me, the fact that liberty is, does not rest upon some central planner's dream actually speaks volumes on its behalf. It says basically that people under liberty are free to be themselves, to be who they are. You cannot be fully human unless you're free. Can you imagine what life would be like without liberty? I think it would be unthinkable. So that's one of the arguments I think that we should stress more these days, especially with young people. That liberty is right because 
It, is, it rests upon people being themselves, being who they are, not being the cogs in somebody else's machine, not being robots that someone else will pre-program. Second argument, and I don't necessarily mean that to suggest it's less important than the first. In fact, I could make a case it's more important, is this. Liberty is the only system that requires high standards of character. Think about it. It's the only one. You could be, pardon the expression, you could be a scumbag and fit into just about any other system in the world. Because they don't ask much of you, except your money, and your lives, and your liberties. But liberty demands, if we're to have it, it demands that we be people of high character. What do I mean by that? I mean by character, I mean, that's a term we use in a lot of ways, don't we? Sometimes we use it when we say somebody is a character. Uh, other times we say somebody has character. I am referring to those positive traits that almost everybody would say, yeah, I agree, even if I don't live up to it all the time. Uh, that's a trait, or those are traits that I agree we'd all be better off if more people lived up to them. I mean things like honesty. I don't think you could have a free society if people are widely and regularly dishonest, if they don't keep the word, if contracts can't be counted upon, if people steal. Just can't, I mean, you could have any other kind of contrivance, socialism, statism of any variety, but you can't have liberty. It's the one system that requires widespread practice of the basic character virtue of honesty. But there are other virtues, other character traits that it requires of us too. Humility is one. And I, by humility, I don't mean uh, self-deprecation in any way. I mean the wisdom to know how much you, uh, that, that there's much that you don't know. You're probably all familiar with Leonard Reed's famous essay, I Pencil. I know you are, John. You knew Leonard yourself. It goes back to 1958, so it's been around a long time. Lots of people around the world have read it. It remains one of our most popular essays, probably in its I don't know, 20th edition in print, as well as online. The message of my pencil is that nobody in the world, no one person, knows how to make a pencil from scratch. Something as simple as a pencil, because to know how to make one would mean you would know how to be a miner, how to find the stuff that comes from the earth that forms the, we often call lead, but typically graphite, I guess, the metal that forms the ferrule, the rubber that the, uh, that the eraser is made from. You'd have to be a logger. You'd have to be you know, just endless uh, responsibilities and duties are performed by lots of different people who don't even know each other typically, but whose talents come together in the magic of the marketplace to produce something as simple and profound as a pencil. I've always read that uh, and come away from it, having read it many times, thinking that, wow, if, uh, if I had any temptation to think high of myself, uh, I'm going to have second thoughts now because I realize how little I know. There's a universe of information out there yet that I don't know. And as long as I'll live, there'll still be a universe of knowledge that I'll never know. Now what does that say? What are the implications of that for our lives? Well, that means that each of us is going to have a pretty difficult time to begin with, planning every aspect of the next 10, 20, 50, 80 years of our lives. How much more difficult would it be if we set upon ourselves the task of planning the lives of several hundred million others? Preposterous, isn't it? Utterly preposterous, and yet you have, the world is full of people who in many cases have made a mess of their own lives, but nonetheless think they can plan everybody else's. They lack humility, and a simple implement as a pencil uh, could teach them a lot. So humility is an important virtue in a free society. The absence of it gives rise to know-it-all, arrogant and condescending central planner types who think they can push you around because they know best. A society based and rooted in liberty is a society of humble people who make learning a lifelong job. Another trait is responsibility. What do irresponsible people look like? And how conducive is that to a society that's free? 
Irresponsible people make bad choices and then blame others for the consequences. I don't see how a free society is possible if, that's, if that attitude is widely practiced. Liberty requires that we be responsible, that we take responsibility for our actions. There are many other traits of, of character, and, and I don't mean to go into those tonight, it's another lecture, but I do want to tell you that in recalibrating fee to focus on younger people, we've determined that one of the best ways to get these points across to young people is through the use of stories. Not graphs, not equations, not dry definitions, you need a little bit of that, but what really uh, resonates with people, young people in particular, are stories that dramatize your point. And I'm a great believer that few of us read enough biographies of great men and women who are exemplars of character and in the process, good citizens for liberty. So I want to share with you, in the remaining time I have, uh, a couple of three stories about people who I think uh, shine as examples of character, the kind of people that liberty requires. A couple of them are from the pages of history, but there's one that I'll end with who's still alive, and I'll tell you more about him in a minute. I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks, but he'll be my, my last story. The first person I want to share uh, a little bit with you about is uh, Thomas Clarkson. How many of you know him? Know that name? Uh, Anti slavery? Yes, absolutely. How many of you have seen the movie Amazing Grace? Yes. Okay. Uh, that movie focuses on William Wilberforce, yes. who led the effort in Parliament against the slave trade and then later slavery itself in the late uh, 18th and early 19th century. But another figure in the movie, who Wilberforce himself in real life said was indispensable to the cause, was Thomas Clarkson. And I'm drawn to his story in part because it's not as well known as Wilberforce's, and yet Wilberforce himself said we couldn't have done it without him. Young Thomas Clarkson in the 1780s was a student at Cambridge University. Who was I talking to who's been? In? Yeah, in your home in Cambridge? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, not and this is where Tom, Thomas Clarkson uh, went to school. He was going to be an Anglican minister. But something happened on the high seas, a famous incident, that would change his life and ultimately change the conscience of the nation. It's called the Zong Affair, Z-O-N-G. The Zong was the name of a slave ship, slave trading ship. And like so many of the others, it would leave British ports like Portsmouth and Bristol sail along the coast of Africa, apprehending as many people as it, as it could till they could pack the holds of the ship with hundreds of enslaved people, then take them across the Middle Passage, the Atlantic Ocean, to islands in the Caribbean. Well, the Zong had a particularly long voyage uh, for a variety of reasons, and make many stops before they could round up enough people and put them in chains and into the ship, which meant that those who'd been on the vessel the longest were the most susceptible to disease and privation and abuse. They were in terrible health as the ship approached the Caribbean. And it was at that point when the captain of the Zong made a very cruel and cold calculation. He recognized that a, quite a few of the people on board were emaciated, terrible health, disease-ridden, wouldn't fetch very much at market. So he decided, I can make more money if I just get rid of them and put in for an insurance claim. So he gave the order to throw overboard 132 living souls. That was not uncommon in the centuries of the slave trade. But on this occasion, there were members of the crew who had a conscience and who spoke when the ship returned to Britain. And their story caught the attention of a man, an attorney named Granville Sharp, who was so outraged, he determined he was going to file a suit against the slave ship captain charging murder, taking the court on murder charges. In the end, the judge in the case simply dismissed it. And these are his own words. He said, throwing 132 people overboard in this case was just like throwing horses overboard. 
He said it was nothing more than a civil dispute between a slave ship captain and an insurance company. People of conscience in Britain were outraged. But most people of Britain were indifferent because after all, this was an institution that had been around a long time. There were plenty of intellectuals and scholars and teachers and preachers who were either indifferent to it or who taught that, hey, well, this is the way things are. It's always been that way. Lots of people are doing it. Some people are making money off of it. The richness of some of our ports are dependent upon it. Why rock the boat? But there was a professor at Cambridge who, when that dismissal of the case came down, decided to make this an issue at Cambridge. He was in charge of the annual essay contest that students could enter as long as they wrote their entries in Latin. And it was a very it had a very coveted prize, it was a long-standing, well-known contest. And young Thomas Clarkson decides to enter it. The topic, as that professor named it, was resolved that it's wrong for one man to owe another. So they were really going to get into the core of this issue of slavery. Clarkson knew nothing about slavery. But fortunately, he was a very diligent student. He wasn't just going to write something off the top of his head, a piece of rhetoric, but rather he was going to do some research. So he went to Bristol and to Portsmouth trying to find crew members who would talk and found a few. And in the end, he wrote an essay in which he argued eloquently and brilliantly and powerfully that slavery was a blot on the conscience of the British nation and must come to an end. He won the first prize. Shortly thereafter, he was on horseback, leaving uh, London and headed for his village of Wisbeck. And what happened along that route is marked to this day by an obelisk where you can see this is where what I'm about to tell you happened. He writes about it later in his diary. That's how later people knew where, where it occurred. In his diary, he wrote that as he was on horseback going to Wisbeck, he was in total anguish over what he had learned, what he had written about. And at one point, he couldn't take it any longer, and he got off his horse and fell to his knees. And he said in his diary, it was that, at that point that I said to myself, if what I have written is true, someone must see these calamities to an end. There's a guy of conviction, and he never failed that conviction. He could not have known at that point in his 20s what life would hold in store for him. We now know. He spent the next 61 years of his life to his dying day, first in a campaign to end the trade in slaves, later to end slavery itself, lived for 13 more years to the age of 86, and what did he do in those last 13 years? devoted himself to founding and nurturing private organizations to improve the lot of those who had been enslaved. But when he started out, this was no small order. How's a, how's a Cambridge student going to take on an age-old institution and get Parliament to abolish it? When, uh, there weren't all that many people in Britain who were speaking out against it, but there was one group that had been sort of outspoken, but written off by much of society. Those were the Quakers. Quakers were sort of looked down upon as, you know, they're odd people. They, uh, they don't toe the line. And those Quaker men have this odd habit. If they can get away with it in the presence of nobility, they won't take their hats off because they thought it offended a higher authority. So Clarkson looks around and he says, who can be my allies? And in May of 1787, two years after the contest, and and all this has been percolating in his mind, he finally rounds up 11 other people, mostly Quakers, and around a print shop table in London, they formed the world's first think tank. And that's important to us as a direct, because we run think tanks. It was called the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. It was a single issue think tank. But they knew that we have to change policy. But before we can change policy, we have to change ideas. We have to prick people's consciences. We have to get them thinking. First thing they did was they took Clarkson's essay and translated it from Latin back to English, published it, distributed it. That was the first of many such publications. 
Clarkson himself will be the, uh, as Samuel Taylor Coleridge later called him, the moral steam engine of the anti-slavery movement. For 20 years, from 1787 until the great vote in Parliament to end the slave trade in 1807, Thomas Clarkson will travel on horseback around Britain 35,000 miles, giving speeches and sermons and lecturing on, on this, gathering testimony. If you saw the movie Amazing Grace, you remember when Wilberforce rolls out that huge uh, scroll of signatures on a petition to the outrage of the old crusty parliamentarians who didn't think, you know, we don't do that in Parliament. That's rabble-rousing stuff. Well, it was Clarkson who rounded up those signatures. Clarkson, along with others, went to Wilberforce, a young parliamentarian, early in the struggle and said, we think you're on our side. We think you need a stiffer spine, and, but with that, you could be our man in Parliament. And they convinced him. And he was truly a great figure in this whole movement. But behind the scenes was Thomas Clarkson, bucking him up, getting him testimony, finding the, get, doing the research along with others as the movement grew. And you know, in the first few years, they actually did better each year that Wilberforce introduced the bill to end the trade in slaves, until 1793 when it all went in the other direction, because Britain went to war with France. Later, that would be the war uh, that, uh, in which Napoleon Bonaparte would play the lead role from 1799 to 1815. Um, and at the start of the war, what do you have? You have the pro-slavery people in Parliament saying, those anti-slavery people like Wilberforce, they're traitors now. They want to hand this lucrative business over to the French. They're traitors. Clarkson and Wilberforce both are threatened on many occasions. Well, Clarkson almost lost his life, beaten brutally on the docks of uh, Bristol by slave ship crewmen. But the important thing is, it didn't matter to them what the odds or the obstacles or the prospects for success were. They never gave up. I've always thought of this wonderful story as inspirational, it should be inspirational to all of us who are fighting for liberty because they had tremendous obstacles in front of them. But they showed us that when you know something is right, don't you ever walk away from it. Work for it, fight for it. You want to someday be able to, maybe on the eve of when you check out, you want to be able to look back and at least say, you know, whether you succeeded or not, I at least was not part of the problem. I tried my best to be part of the solution. Well, these guys, fought uh, tooth and nail for the cause they knew to be right. They went to Josiah Wedgwood, the pottery entrepreneur, and said, uh, you need to come up with an image for us that can become our, what we would call today, a logo, symbol of the movement to help inspire people. Wedgwood comes up with this image of a kneeling black man in chains, hands in prayer, looking upward, and around the perimeter of wherever this image appeared, like plates, mugs, and what have you, it said, am I not a man and a brother? And that was intended and it succeeded into jarring people into realizing this evil institution of slavery, though you can't see it down the street, is exacting a horrific toll on its victims. And it should exact a toll on your conscience as well. Finally, the great day came, and it's depicted so beautifully in that film, although the film doesn't tell you, it was 4 a.m. in the morning in Parliament in February of 1807. For all those 20 years, losing every vote every year by wide margins most of the time, finally, in February of 1807, Parliament by a wide margin, not even close, overwhelmingly votes to end the trade in slaves. One of the most incredible moments in the history of human liberty. Why did it happen? 20 years before, nobody thought it could, except Clarkson and a handful of Quakers. Great lesson. And I should tell you that at that moment, when they won that battle, they could have said, people like Wilberforce and Clarkson, well, you know, we fought hard, we took a lot of risks, almost lost our lives on more than one occasion, let's uh, leave the next battle up to somebody else, but they didn't. They knew that this was just a way station that the big battle was yet to come, and that was to liberate those who had been enslaved. Guess how many more years that will take? 26. 
So they're at this 46 years. 20 years to end the trade in slaves, 26 more until 1833 to get Parliament to pass a bill. It took effect one year later to liberate all those within the reach of the British Empire who were slaves. In a great book by uh, Adam Hochschild called Bury the Chains, which is a history of this movement, he talks about what happened on so many Caribbean islands the night before the law took effect. And many slaves went to the highest point on those islands to be there when the sun went up. Because to them it was a new day in more ways than one. Thomas Clarkson is now well into his 70s. But he's 73. But he lives another 13 years, as I mentioned, devotes his life to helping improve the lot of those who did enslaved. One of his biographers, Ellen Gibson Wilson, uh, summed him up pretty well in this line. She said, Thomas Clarkson, 1760 to 1846, a man who gave his life to liberate those he never met from lands he never saw. What a hero for humanity. When he died in 1846, a man who not so many years before was ridiculed, attacked, threatened, written off as a weirdo. London saw one of the largest funerals it had seen in decades. And Hochschild reports in his book what many of the Quaker men at the funeral did, the sons and the grandsons of those who had enlisted early in the movement. They took off their hats. Then this was a real hero. Thomas Clark. I, I, I know I spent a little more time on him than, than you might have expected, but I, I'll move on and mention a couple more. Am I all right, Anthony? Okay. I'm okay. You're okay if you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many of you have heard the name Fanny Crosby? Fanny Crosby? No, she was. Fanny Crosby has, uh, not even 100 years ago, she was still alive. She died in 1915, lived to the age of 95. She was born in 1820, lived to 1915. Uh, she was, 100 years ago, the most revered and respected and admired woman in America. And yet today, hardly anybody knows the name. Report. And maybe, what's that? Was it a reporter? No. A number of things about her. One, she was noted for her incredible charitable work. Uh, in the 1870s, in the 1870s, when there was a, a cholera epidemic in New York, New York City, uh, she and many thousands fled the city. She stayed behind and. Uh, uh, administered and nursed the sick, contracted cholera herself, but later recovered. Well, that's, that's pretty notable. Other things about her, though. Uh, she was the first woman to address the United States Congress. And you'd think that would at least earn her a footnote in history books, right? Didn't she? Why would she be uh, invited to do that? How many of you have met one American president? How many, of you, how many of you met two or more? Would you agree that if somebody met five, uh, that would be pretty remarkable, right? How many of you have met one Bahamian, Bahamian prime minister? More than three. More than five. Uh, the same amount of five times. <laughs> okay, well. My point is, to, to the best of our, uh, of our knowledge, Fanny Crosby met, came to know, more American presidents than anybody ever in our history. <clears throat> Some of them she met after they were president. But how many would you guess? We've had 44. How many do you think Fanny Crosby, who holds the record, met? 21. She met almost half of the men who served as president. Every single one from John Quincy Adams to Woodrow Wilson. So that suggests, wow, what was it about her? Well, here's another fact. She holds the record to this day for having written the lyrics, the words, to more songs, and in her case, almost all were hymns, than anybody else in human history. She wrote almost 9,000. 
thousand song. Mm. On any given Sunday to this day, there are probably several million people around the world still singing Fanny Crosby hymns. To God be the glory, a blessed assurance. But here's the most remarkable thing about her. She never had any memory, no recollection of ever having seen a thing. She was completely blind from the age of six months. Completely. Never saw a thing. And when she spoke to the Congress, guess what her message was? It was not, I'm disadvantaged, where's my check? Her message was, all of us are called to do everything in our power, regardless of our handicaps, to be the best examples we can be in a free society. Use whatever talents you have to their fullest. She was a woman of incredible and inspirational character. She just didn't take no, didn't take a handicap lying down. She just, she was a steam engine. Lived to the age of 95. The third and final person that I want to tell you about tonight, uh, and obviously this talk is adaptable too. I sometimes, if I've given it to an audience, I say, well, I'll give you the talk under the same title, but different people. Uh, so I picked from a list. But the third one is still living. And I will have the opportunity to see him again. He's become a good friend in just two weeks. He lives in Maidenhead, England. His name is Sir Nicholas Winton, W-I-N-T-O-N. I urge you to look him up, Google him, and you'll see a lot of great stuff. There's been an Emmy Award-winning documentary made about uh, the story I'm about to tell you. This is a man of extraordinary character. And his story shows that character not only enriches lives, it can save lives. Here's Nicky Winton's story. In 1938, Nicky Winton was a stockbroker in London in his late 20s. That was a pivotal year, we now know it wasn't looking back. 1938 was the last full year of peace before the Second World War broke out. It was in March of that year that Hitler absorbed Austria. In the summer, he starts making noises about uh, the Sudetenland, the border region between Germany and, and uh, Czechoslovakia. There's a big conference in Munich in September of 38. And Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returns from that conference and on the tarmac in London, waving that piece of paper proclaiming, what? Yeah. Peace, Peace in our time. And the world pretty much did breathe a sigh of relief for the moment. People thought, ah, you know, um, maybe we've averted war. The French and the British have said to the Germans, if you can have the Sudan land, just go, don't get, go any further, don't take anything else, we'll have peace, but you can have that. And of course, it's to this day known as a, a very ignominious moment of, of appeasement. It's in that atmosphere of people thinking, hey, you know, for the moment things seem to be okay, that Nicky Winton is planning a Christmas vacation to Switzerland. But he's not one who was deluded by the Munich Agreement. He sensed trouble was coming. But before he left for Switzerland, he got a call from a good friend who worked at the British Embassy in Prague, telling him, Nicky, don't go to Switzerland. Come here. There's something you must see. And he prevailed upon him, his, uh, his friend did, and he went to Prague. And what his friend wanted him to see were refugee camps in and around Prague at the start of winter, freezing conditions, makeshift tents and housing for thousands of mostly Jewish families who had fled, in some cases, Germany, Poland, and in most cases, the Sudetenland that Hitler had just occupied. They're here in Prague, no place to go. No government in the world recognizes that they're in any danger and will let them leave that country and come to theirs. So Nicky's going through these camps, and what does he find? Mothers and fathers begging him, a perfect stranger, begging him, please, can you take our children? Get them out of harm's way. We can't get out, but can you take the children back with you to Britain? He could have said, oh, I feel for you. Uh, what can I do? I'm supposed to be on vacation. Wish I could help. See you later. But Nicky Winton is not that kind of person. 
He knew the danger, and he immediately swung into action. First thing he did was he sent telegrams, letters to governments all over the world describing the situation and saying, if I can get the children out at least, will you allow them to enter your country? Guess how many governments, and he wrote to dozens, how many of them said, yes, they can come in here? How many? Only two. His own Britain and Sweden. In Britain, the Home Office said, but you have to put the equivalent of, in today's money, about $3,000 on deposit per child. Because we think this is going to blow over, our official policy is peace in our time, and we don't want to have to get stuck with a bill of sending it back, so, you know. So we had to raise money. He will end up, over the next several months into 1939, arranging for rail transports out of Prague of 669 children. Nine transports altogether, but the first eight will take 669 out of the country. He found foster families, a few in Sweden, mostly in Britain, so that every child was spoken for. The only reason he couldn't tell anybody about this, even, as, even the woman who later he met and married became his wife, he couldn't tell her for 50 years, is because of what happened to the ninth transport. It was the largest of them all. He had 250 kids ready to go, foster families ready for them in Britain. At Prague Station on the 1st of September, 1939, the day the war broke out, the Nazis stopped all rail transports. Not a single one of those 250 kids survived. Most of those who did get out in those first eight transports never saw their parents again. Nikki joined the RAF as soon as the war began, fought uh, for the rest of the war. Later met the woman who became his wife, as I say, didn't tell her about this. But 50 years later, in 1988, she's going through the attic, and they, she finds this box, scrapbook, full of names, visa material, pictures of kids, and so forth, and wants to know, what's this all about? He finally tells her. Yeah, all the kids had grown up in their foster families. They needed to stay in touch with them. Uh, then one thing leads to another. And this is a great moment in television history. I never get tired of seeing it. It's a part of this documentary. They take this clip from a TV show in Britain in 1989. Uh, a friend of Nikki's wife had, had gotten a hold of this stuff, went to the TV station, and uh, they decided, let's do a program on this guy's story as part of this series called That's Life or It's Your Life. We had programs like that in America, too. And so they summoned him to the studio. And he knows they're going to do a program about the, what he did all these years before. He doesn't know anything else, though. He doesn't know that they've gone through the list to try to find as many of those children who are now in their 50s and 60s as they can find. They found hundreds. And there, in this wonderful clip uh, from that TV show, you see the hostess of the program explaining what Nikki Winton had done 50 years before. And then she says, might there be someone in this audience who was among the children that Nikki Winton saved half a century ago? If so, please stand. Well, everybody in the audience was one of them. So the entire audience stands. And he turns around, and there they are. Uh, and here he is, all these years later, at age 103 and a half, <laughs> still going strong. I called him just a few days ago to say, I'm coming back to see you again, bring you my brother-in-law in a couple weeks. You're going to be around. Before I could even tell him that, when I just said, Nikki, this is Larry Reed, he said, when are you coming? <laughs> I mean, he's just, it, his wife has since passed on. He's living still by himself, still gardens. Uh, a remarkable guy. But when you meet with him and you say anything like, Nikki, you're such a hero. He cuts you short and says, don't call me that. I just did what I, the papers call him Britain Schindler. But he doesn't, he says, I just did what I could. He's such a humble man. He could have, and you wouldn't blame it, he could have made a fortune writing a book about this. But he didn't, which tells you what. He did what he could. He did the right thing. It wasn't for fame or fortune. It was because it was the right thing. How unfashionable, how refreshing. Thank God for people like that. That's the kind of person that liberty demands. And he's a pivotal example. 
wonderful example of how character not only enriches lives, it can save them too. And liberty is the only system that depends upon it. So with that, I want to say thank you for being so attentive for the long talk. And uh, I'll be happy if you're if you have questions to take them. But if you do have to go, I, I understand. I kept you alone. Fantastic story and speech, but we're used to that, I'm afraid, <laughs> from you. Um, and, and now you refocus to the 16 to 24 year old. How are you actually going to get them to come and listen in the first place? Are they not somewhat libertarian themselves, or are you going to try and dangle some carrots to come along and, and listen? Well, a very good question. Do you all hear the question? How are we going to get kids to come? Uh, I took over Fee in, in September of 08, and we immediately began to make changes in our seminars that I thought were improvements. And lo and behold, uh, our, we have set records each year in the numbers of the, at the summer seminars, and we get a great turnout at shorter events we do during the course of the year. So much so that last year we set T. We've doubled the number that we accept at the summer seminars, but we've quadrupled the number who want to come. So we're actually, getting them to come is not a problem. Mm -hmm. And next, next year we're going to go from seven summer, summer, summer seminars to ten. But we're getting uh, good numbers around the country at all day Saturday events too. Uh, how many you have in attend when you say good numbers? How many come to these things? Well, uh, we limit them to about a hundred. Well, we've gone over in a couple cases to a hundred. But you get a hundred in each one. Oh yeah, with a long waiting list. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, one right. Bohemian attended last summer. Oh. In, really? at Irby, in Atlanta, uh, as, uh, He can yeah. tell the story. Oh, she's here. No. no. Oh, you know. Oh, how are yes. you, Professor? <laughs> you were there? No, a student. A student of his. Oh, okay. Did she like it? Love it. It was a she, right? You said yes, that? yes. Okay. Love and love. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Well, uh, here's another thing that we're doing to attract them. Yeah. Uh, at the one-day programs, which become a feeder then to the summer more intensive program, mm -hmm. we're organizing those around three sub-themes. Liberty, character, and entrepreneurship. And we want the students, and there are adults who are coming to these too, but their focus is on students. We want them at the end of the day to understand not only what liberty is, what it's not. We want them to understand its connection to character. And then finally, we want them to leave feeling like, wow, if I choose to be an entrepreneur, I shouldn't hang my head in shame. I should be proud. It's a noble profession. It feeds people. It clothes people. It, 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 and making a profit is a good thing. It means I've taken $100 worth of stuff and made it worth 150 Any flunky can take $100 worth of stuff and make it worth only 50 Anybody make a loss. Uh, you know, we want them to appreciate those three things and how they're interconnected. Because a lot of our students will, you know, some will go into academia, but most will not that went into business in some way. We're calling this our Blinking Lights Initiative, or project. And I don't know if you know that story. I'll just tell you all real quick where that name comes from. Uh, I spent time with the Polish Underground in 1986. I know I've told this to you, but I've heard that before. And one of the, uh, two of the people, one couple that I met, were, had run underground radio for solidarity during the Marshall Law period. This is before big changes in 89. And in 86, with the communist regime still very much in power, I met with them not long after they'd been uh, imprisoned and, but released. And I asked them a lot of questions about running an underground radio. And uh, at one point I said, how did you know if people were listening? And Sophia uh, Romashevsky, the woman, answered this way. She said, we wondered that too. We could only broadcast eight or ten minutes at a time. And then we had to go off the air to avoid detection, because so they sell, set it up again. But we asked people one night, if you believe in liberty, the message of this station, blink your lights and call your friends, who you know would be of the same view, and ask them to do the same. And she said, we then went to the window, and for hours, all of Warsaw was blinking. <laughs> so we tell the students, you're part of the Blinking Lights Project, and your job when you leave this seminar, if you're so moved, is to be a blinking light for liberty and be sure that you never, ever 
let your light go out. And uh, we have lofty ambitions, but we're going to change the world. And uh, so, yeah. okay. Do you think that um, the schools of business and economics in the United States, there's enough emphasis on uh, ethics and morality and um, has there been more emphasis on that since the um, financial crisis of 2008? And do you think that um, some of the people who are responsible for the, for the crash, I'm speaking specifically about some of the investment bankers, have been um, adequately uh, punish, shall we say, for their, the role they play and the devastation that they have caused uh, around the world. Yeah, well, several good questions there. Uh, when it comes to ethics and character training in, in business schools and colleges, there is a lot more of it, at least on paper. Mm -hmm. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's being taught well. And, uh, the problem is that you know one of the most insidious forces of our time has been uh, moral relativism, and that's infused itself into academia thoroughly, even into business colleges, even into ethics courses where they, you know, they say they're teaching ethics, but they can't quite bring themselves to say definitively there right. there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And those aren't relevant. Uh, they often they can't quite bring themselves in. And I don't know how you really teach it unless you uh, instill in, in young people that there are standards that are right, whether you agree with them or not. And uh, uh, maybe we, maybe they need to do more in the way of inspiring stories of real people. If you try to teach ethics out of a textbook in a sterile way, uh, avoiding any definitive pronouncements about what's right and what's wrong, I don't know that you want very much. So I think the, the way it's taught could, can be greatly improved. I mean, you asked also about uh, uh, some of the roots of the financial crisis being in the uh, bad character of, of certain characters. But no question that that's the case. But they're not just in business. Uh, there are plenty of bad characters in government. And plenty of bad characters in government that created the environment in which those bad characters in business could do what they did. Uh, I think there's a, a serious erosion of character across the board in all professions. Uh, it's, and it's no better in government than it is in business. It's society-wide. Uh, we, we need a moral renovation from the ground up. Uh, but it's not going to come by any act of Congress. I mean, any other Congress should stop, uh, you know, jawboning banks to make loans that should never be made. Uh, the Federal Reserve should stop making funny money to uh, create bubbles in the economy. And the bad characters in Washington who vote for that stuff need to change their ways. The bad characters in business that uh, make a lot of money off of it, run to the government to protect them from their own poor judgments, need to. Yeah. So, a second question. Um, Free is associated with um, educating people about finance and economics, right? A fee. Fee, yes. Fee. A fee. Uh, well, with an important caveat. Well, can, can I, is that tied to liberty. Yeah. It, okay, I understand that. Um, what percentage of people in the United States would you say are financially and economically illiterate? Illiterate or literate? Illiterate. Illiterate. Oh. Yeah. It's overwhelming. Uh, See, because to me, yeah, this, I, this would be, should be the focus yeah. of your teaching of these young people. Yeah. Well, uh, when you say financial literacy, there is an important need you know, to know how to balance a checkbook. That's not our area, though. Uh, more so, how the system works. How a free system works. Well, how the system of the economy works and how the system of finance works in general. Most people are not aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we see uh, we do have a, 
a firm position. It isn't, it isn't just that you should know how the system works, it's also that you should know how the, a superior system rooted in freedom works. And our system has strayed considerably from that. There's an awful lot of crony capitalism. Uh, there's an awful lot of people seeking government to do things that are none of its business. Uh, that's what, that's, uh, they need to know that as much as they need to know how to balance a checkbook. Well, I thank you all. I appreciate it. My turn now is to thank you and present you oh, with a book as a token of our appreciation. Uh, but this time, it's so special because. Uh, we're going to have to move here now. <laughs> no, it's, it's special because we have one of the authors here who's going to orthograph it for you. All oh. right. <laughs> John Thompson. Yeah, that's me. Wow. <laughs> well, we met earlier yes. when you were coming with, uh, with Storm. Hey, thank you. Wow, this was fantastic. Yes, please autograph it. I guess I need to let you do that rather than come right through right now. I'm eager to do that. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, we hope that uh, you keep on coming with this uh, inspiring uh, messages. For well, we're so happy. Thank you. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.